Good evening to all and welcome to um, this launch of the first report of the Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, this event. The Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance was launched in September 2021 with the generous support of the Fondation Piquetet pour le Développement. It is anchored in and coordinated by the Geneva Graduate Institute and it brings together international organizations, financial and academic partners. The vision of the lab is to become a research center of excellence for impact measurement, a necessary step for scaling up impact investment today. The mission that we set ourselves is to produce actionable and pragmatic research on the key frontiers for sustainable finance and particularly on impact measurement and reporting. As mentioned, the Swiss lab was envisioned from the start as a collaborative initiative. We aim to achieve our mission through a multi-stakeholder collaboration with researchers from Swiss universities, universities from developing countries and international organizations. This is the first such collaborative effort in Switzerland. The lab combines from the start its Swiss roots with an international dimension by establishing its presence within international Geneva and partnering with international organizations like the IFC and the ICRC. The lab also aspires to train the next generation of social scientists and professionals in sustainable finance. Over the last 18 months at the Institute, we've launched a new specialization in sustainable finance in our interdisciplinary master, and we will be opening a one year professional master this September. Targeting young professionals with a few years of experience. At the Geneva Graduate Institute, we've been able to build upon a long and solid presence in the field of finance for development that was generally financed through the years by the Fondation Piquetet pour le Développement. Building on those foundations, we've more recently extended our questions and queries to finance and sustainability and associated current frontiers and main challenges. Today, I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the launch of the lab's first report, which presents the empirical results of the first phase of our initial project, the impact measurement project. Sustainability concerns are now one of the most profound societal trends of our time, needless to say, I don't need to insist on that. Financial institutions are asked to account for environmental, social and governance effects in a transparent way and to invest in a responsible manner. ESG accountability has its own challenges and while it's important to keep working and, and addressing those challenges, it is quite clear also that the urgency today is also to go one significant step further as soon as possible, in fact. The new frontier is impact, which focuses on purposefully engaging towards SDG goals, purposefully contributing to measurable positive uh, social and environmental outcomes that are potentially highly transformative. The new ground, therefore, for all of us is the construction of shared standards and metrics allowing to go beyond reporting and towards purposeful and impactful investment and project development. The end goal of the impact measurement project that we um, are discussing today uh, is that precisely to develop, to build consensus around and to contribute to the deployment and the implementation of a parsimonious impact measurement framework that can be adopted broadly and in many different contexts and industries. The key partners behind this first project are the International Finance Corporation at the World Bank, which, as you know, uh, is the largest global development institution focused on the private sector. The Geneva Finance Research Institute at the University of Geneva and the Geneva Graduate Institute. I'm looking forward myself to listening to our panelists tonight as they discuss the results of this first phase. And at this stage, I would just like to finish with a few thanks. My first thanks go to the project team uh, itself, headed by Professor Rania gibson brandon from, um, uh, from UNIGE and Dr. Camilo mondragon Velez from the IFC. And all the authors and researchers that have contributed to this report under their lead. I would also like to thank the panelists for today who have accepted to come and discuss this uh, first set of results. Uh, as well as Karen Wilson, who will be today's moderator. Professor 
Patrick Bolton, who heads the lab, um, the lab scientific advisory board, will be also uh, commenting. Maria Teresa Zapia, who is the CEO of Blue Art Orchard. I would also like to thank um, uh, Sustainable Finance Geneva for partnering with us on this uh, event, uh, as, as well as on uh, many other uh, things throughout the year. And we also enjoy very much our collaboration uh, with SFG on uh, building bridges. I would like to thank also naturally the management and the academic coordinators of the lab, Melita Leusi and Nathan Sussman, as well as all the colleagues from the Center for Finance and Development at the Institute and beyond within the International Economics Department, who have been in one way or another active in or strong supporters of the, that project and of the lab. Last but not least, I would like to thank Yvan Piquet and the Fondation Piquet pour le Développement for their unfailing support over now a number of years of the initiatives of the Institute in this field. So that said, I'm looking very much forward to uh, listening to all of you and I will hand it over to Nathan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marie-Laure, for the, for the introduction. I'm not your moderator, I'm not Karen Wilson, but you will uh, Hopefully, join us in uh, in a few minutes. We have some technical issues, but uh, let me uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Anya Gibson Brandon from the University of Geneva, who will uh, present the first part of the presentation of the paper. So, Rania, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you first question? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. This is uh, the first part of a long project, as uh, Marie Laure Salle said, which is on impact measurement. But this first report, we wanted to assess the quality of firms' ESG reporting and of uh, impact investors. Uh, impact measurement practices. So the main research question that we are addressing tonight is what is the current state of the art in firms ESG reporting and impact investor impact measurement practices? And my focus is going to be on the quality of firms ESG uh, disclosure. So the first issue is, well, why does it matter? Why should we talk about the quality of firms ESG reporting? And let me give you a few motivations because of the reduced time that I have. So in a global survey of about 400 international institutional investors, Amel Zadeh and Sarah found, found that vagueness of the firm's ESG data and their lack of quantification were seen by respectively 39.4 and 37.8% of the respondents as one of their major impediments to invest responsibly. Uh, these firms' ESG reports are also the raw data when we come to uh, the rating setters and them providing ESG ratings. And uh, one study that we did with my colleague Kruger and Schmidt basically showed that there's huge disagreement among ESG rating providers. You see that for the environmental pillar, among the six rating providers, the average correlation for a representative firm is 0.43. It drops down to 0.32 for the social pillar and less than 0.20 for the governance pillar. Now, why does it matter? Well, this matters because in that same study, we show that ESG rating disagreement increases uh, stock returns, uh, investors are asking for a premium to bear that risk, and this increases firms' cost of capital. And let me just uh, finally cite again Amel Zadeh and Sarah Fime's study. They found also that 63.1% of the investor use ESG information because they say it's material to their investment performance. So let me go straight into the study. So we had an international sample of about 30 firms, and these were firms selected because they have signed the World Economic Forum stakeholder capitalism metrics, so they are good citizens. And we selected those 30 firms that actually have the largest market cap. I'm sorry? They are internationally... I'm always talking to Karen. They are internationally uh, present, but they are, there is a tilt. There's somebody, sorry, there's somebody talking at the same time. 
yes, sorry. So these firms are essentially located in the States and Germany, but still an international diversification. And they're also representing several economic sectors with a tilt toward the pharma industry, the IT and the energy uh, sector. Now, how do we assess this quality of firms ESG reporting? So this is our own uh, sort of criteria that we uh, defined here. And of course, they can be prone to criticism. I'm looking forward to listening to them. So the first criteria was comprehensiveness. Do the firm report on all three environmental, social and governance pillars? And do they do this with enough granularity? The second important criteria we selected was materiality. Is there ESG efforts material to enterprise value? And does it also satisfy the double materiality uh, criteria? Transparency was assessed based on five criteria, but mostly we were trying to distinguish between hard and soft information and validate more firmly those firms that had hard KPIs versus more lengthy uh, textual uh, description of what they were doing. Now, auditing, we looked at this is a binary issue, looking at whether the firms were audited or not in terms of their sustainability reports. And then two criteria about their impact reporting. We wanted to see if within their sustainability reports, firms also reported on their impact. And secondly, in the sixth criteria, whether this is aligned with at least one of the SDG uh, development uh, goals. And the final criteria was whether these firms were actually using one of the well-known international ESG reporting uh, standard. Now, let me walk you quickly through the results. So what we found first for comprehensiveness, they are quite good news. Two thirds of the firm seem to report comprehensively on all three environmental, social and governance pillars. When it comes to materiality and double materiality, the picture is much less rosy because only 11 of those large firms seem to provide information that's deemed material to enterprise value and to impact. So a large uh, degree and basically uh, 12 of them are re reporting, sorry, immaterial information. Now, transparency, uh, we found that 18 of these firms uh, provided full transparency according to our five criteria and uh, 10 of them were partially transparent and two were absolutely not transparent. And on the right hand side of this slide, you can see the hard KPI metrics that were the most often uh, labeled or present in these reports. And you can see a strong tilt towards the environmental pillar, especially CO2 emissions and much less indicators on the social and even more loopholes in the governance uh, disclosure and transparency. Now, in terms of impact, if you look at the left hand side, so all of them report on impact and uh, there's a variety of ways in which they do that. Some of them, seven, use dedicated impact reports in addition to their sustainability reports. Five report uh, on impact that's unrelated to core business, but the large majority report on impact related to their ESG efforts. So there seems to be a blending between their impact and their ESG efforts, which is quite uh, welcome. Now, when it comes to adherence with at least one SDG, so all of them were compliant in this uh, perspective. I'll uh, finish with the uh, auditing. So 24 or 80% of the sample were providing audited reports and uh, all of them aligned with at least one of the reporting standards that are internationally recognized. So what are the positive elements that we can gather from these preliminary studies? So first of all, the, the good news I think is that all these 30 benchmarked firms used uh, at least one of the sustainability frameworks 
And most of them, 29 out of the 30, use the GRI standard, which means that in contrast to what we often see in the media and in the press, there is a certain degree of comparability that's allowed across those firms' ESG disclosure quality. Now, the good news is also they seem for two thirds of them to report comprehensively, but however, with a tilt towards the environmental uh, pillar. 24 uh, presented audited sustainability reports, but with one caveat is that for many of those firms, the audited part was only on the environmental pillar and in particular on CO2 uh, emissions. Now, while all companies report on impact in generally, it is primarily related to their ESG efforts, which seems logical. And finally, in terms of complying with the SDGs, on average, these firms uh, said or allegedly uh, confirmed that they were compliant with 11 of the SDGs. One firm was actually saying that they only comply with one SDG, and actually seven firms said they complied with all of the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, which is a bit hard to uh, believe. Now, let me talk about the negatives. So the negatives is really about transparency and materiality. Only 18 firms are really deemed to be fully transparent. And this is the basis for going forward and using the data, you know, in terms of reporting and ratings, in terms of uh, potentially increasing firms cost of capital and so forth. The same applies to materiality where actually only firms, only 11 firms complied fully with at least four of the five criteria that we selected uh, below. So only 11 firms complied in both the case of materiality and double materiality. So let me conclude with some caveats and the next steps. So first of all, we should be cautious in the sense that our study has a sample selection bias, which was intended. We selected the good students, those firms that were signing this web capitalism uh, principles instead of using a randomly selected uh, sample where I think the results would have been much less uh, positive, let's say. The second issue, uh, an interesting question we could ask ourselves over time is, uh, you know, in Europe, there's been the EU taxonomy, the CSRD. So one question that would be nice with the time series evolution of this exercise is, will the disclosure quality gap between the EU and the US widen even further post these uh, regulations enforcement or will it actually uh, stay as it is now? Uh, a third issue is uh, that in Europe, at least, the idea is to apply these reporting frameworks to small and medium firms. And for them, the cost benefit analysis, of course, has to be uh, taken into consideration. And uh, uh, a byproduct of this study, which we sort of see between the line here, is that it, at least from the firm's perspective, the ESG and impact metrics seem to be somehow aligned for 18 uh, of them, which is quite a substantial fraction of our sample. So I will close here, of course, I'm sure Patrick and the other uh, panelists and will have a lot to say about what we did here. I would like now to leave the floor to uh, Camilo, my co-author, who uh, looked more closely at uh, the quality of investors' impact measurement practices. So thank you all for your attention. Hey, thank you, Raina. I'm glad to see that uh... Karen and uh, Maria Teresa were able to uh, join. So let me share my slides here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to present to you the second uh, part of the, uh, of the study, which uh, has to do with impact investors. Um, and basically we see a two, two challenges, uh, related to the sizable growth that we've seen in the impact investing industry over the past years. The first one is, uh, 
that there is a growing number of investment vehicles uh, that claim to be uh, impact investing vehicles. Uh, the second one is this proliferation of bespoke measurement systems and metrics to be able to communicate about the uh, impact that they are generating with uh, such investments. So I'll refer very quickly to the first one. Uh, we see very positive steps over the past years uh, on, on this issue of what is impact investment and what is not. We have the UNEPFI principles for positive impact. And later in 2019, IFC uh, launched the operating principles for uh, impact management, which uh, were transferred uh, recently. Uh, the secretariat was transferred to, uh, to the global impact investing uh, network. Uh, in these uh, operating principles, we define impact investments are those, as, as those that are made into companies with the intent uh, to contribute to measurable positive social or environmental impact alongside a financial return. So uh, basically there's three clear criteria uh, which has to do with intent, contribution and measurement to be able to uh, claim to be uh, an impact investor. And further than that, the operating principles for impact management uh, provide a process uh, on how to manage for impact. Uh, which is very important for this issue of the uh, of, of calling uh, yourself an impact investor. Uh, however, the process is agnostic about how to uh, assess and measure uh, that impact. And this basically goes to our second issue. So we see we think in general that the the first issue there's been progress and uh, and and we can now more clearly define. Who are the impact investors uh, in the whole um, investment space? Uh, but the second one on the proliferation of uh, measurement systems and metrics uh, is where we want to uh, contribute to through all this project in general and uh, this paper as uh, the first uh, phase of the project. When you look at the landscape for impact management and measurement, what you see is that it is a very complex space. Uh, impact investors uh, basically have all these different guidelines uh, from reporting standards for enterprises, some of the ones that uh, Raina mentioned on GRI, SASB, etc., uh, to like impact metrics for investors as those proposed by uh, the HIPSO, which is this group of uh, development finance institutions, and also Iris Plus, which is uh, managed by uh, the GIN and others. Uh, there's, there are global conversations at the impact management uh, platform, which replace, which, which basically is the, the second phase of the impact management project, where you get together these two uh, groups of institutions, reporting standards, and others that are providing guidance for uh, management for impact. Uh, so this is quite a complex uh, space uh, where investors have different tools to be able to. Um, choose from to manage, but also uh, report on impact. So along these lines, what is the motivation for this research? We, we know that in the how uh, to uh, apply the operating principles for impact management, investors will need to have some impact measurement system and associated metrics. Uh, however, as I just show you, there are many uh, metrics and standards to follow. So this is uh, far from clear for investors uh, to be able to, to follow. And of course, this makes convergence uh, quite a challenge. So what we would like is to at least start small and propose some convergence on a core uh, set of key uh, impact and their corresponding uh, metrics. This is where we want to get like the end of the overall uh, project. A word on enterprise impact and investment impact. Uh, it is important to uh, understand that the reporting standards that Raina was talking about are the, uh, is basically reporting of the entire operation of companies. Uh, however, when we are talking about impact investors, what we would like to know is what is the impact generated by a particular investment program uh, that investors are contributing to. Um, and then, of course, uh, 
many uh, investors are using the ESG standards to try to report on impact, but it generates this uh, issue that uh, the ESG standards are usually applied to the operations of entire uh, companies. So, in this second part of the study, what uh, we are doing is, uh, in this first phase, we are conducting a review of the uh, impact investing and measurement practices in the industry. Uh, what we want to do in the coming phases, uh, which I'll refer to at the end of, the, of, of this uh, quick uh, talk, is to identify as that set of core impacts. Which are those core impacts is the first question. Then, uh, what are the best measurements uh, uh, and what is the criteria to be able to select that? And of course, what we want is to leverage from what it already exists in this very complex universe, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and coming up with uh, completely new metrics. That's definitely not the objective of the study. So similar to what Raina mentioned, we again selected the, uh, the, the best students. Uh, and in, the, in, in that sense, we, uh, uh, selected our sample from the top 30 signatories of the impact principles by assets under management at uh, the time where we did this, uh, which uh, which was uh, uh, middle of last year. Uh, you see the spread across the uh, different types of investors uh, that we have, and the results are broken down in uh, in some ways along these lines. And uh, what we do is very similar to what Raina showed you for the firms. We try to assess their approach to impact measurement uh, through some predetermined criteria. So what is that criteria? Uh, similar, but not exactly the same as Raina presented, uh, but more, more thinking about the application of the impact principles. The first one is the uh, if the uh, investors are uh, clearly disclosing what are their strategic objectives uh, related to uh, impact. The second one uh, on standardized impact frameworks is if they clearly are following an impact, uh, an impact system and if they have one uh, that they are following and describe in their uh, disclosure. Uh, the third one is the extent of effects considered. So, the question here um, is if they are uh, limiting themselves to report on impacts on uh, stakeholders around the project in question, or if they are also including broader indirect effects on the economy or the environment. Uh, transparency is, is defined in a very similar way as, as Raina presented on the types of metrics being used and with a focus on, uh, on, on hard metrics. And ESG considerations, we want to build a bridge here, is we want to, uh, to look at uh, how are these impact investors reporting on uh, ESG and if they are following any, any standards. So what did we find? Again, uh, we, we do find some positive trends and some areas for improvement. On the positive trends, uh, we see that uh, two thirds of the uh, impact investors have clear strategic objectives related to impact. They also use hard metrics, so they are very uh, transparent uh, in this way. And all of them uh, consider ESG frameworks, uh, which are already kind of standardized and there are clear guidelines. So, so in that sense, there's, uh, there's already uh, uh, some progress or a lot of progress in the industry. In the areas of improvement, uh, the first one is the use of systematic frameworks. Here we see that only a third of investors are able to disclose clearly what is their impact measurement system, what is the structure and how are they following it. Uh, and second, on the impacts considered, uh, about half of them on limit themselves to only stakeholders around but leave out other important indirect uh, effects. So all these, um, results that we just presented to you are contained in the, uh, the report that we are launching today that is going to be available in the in the lab's website. So we invite everyone to go through it. Uh, as you see, all the details uh, are contained uh, in the report, which, as I have said, is the first uh, phase of our broader project. So what are the next steps? So what we want, what we are working on already is to develop a proof of concept about this let's say parsimonious impact measurement systems. 
system. Uh, we want to identify the uh, which are which should be the priority investment themes and sectors uh, that uh, that that we should focus on based on uh, what impact investors uh, are uh, active on. Then we want again to define a robust criteria to evaluate alternative impact metrics and indicators that are that is substantiated by literature as well as evidence and practice. And finally, of course, disseminate the concept and uh, collect feedback to refine it. Ultimately, as I have said several times, what we want is to uh, expand this to a broader set of sectors and themes. Uh, and ultimate, and, and, and finally, being able to develop uh, a parsimonious impact uh, measurement system that is universal enough to be used by all types of impact investors, regardless of resources and and, and let's say sophistication in the area of impact that promotes uh, broad adoption and comparability, which we think is critical to scale the industry. So with that, I thank you and I look forward to uh, the comments by our uh, discussions and the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Camilo. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here especially after my WebEx uh, challenges. So <laughs> thank you all. Um, and uh, particularly to um, moderate this panel on this really important uh, topic of uh, measurement and disclosure. I mean, we've already heard um, about uh, the presentation on ESG and the great work that Ryan has been doing. And we've just heard about the, the work that Camilo has been doing on impact investing. And, um, you know, these are both very important on one hand, uh, ESG, which as Camilo said, is really about operations and uh, in many ways, risk mitigation. And on the other hand, you know, those who are really pursuing uh, impact and impact strategies. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to turn over to uh, the first of our two discussants. I believe they've already been introduced. Um, but I'd like to invite uh, Professor Patrick Bolton. He's from Imperial College London and also affiliated with Columbia. Patrick, if you would like to um, share your thoughts on the research presented. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Let me share my screen. There is my presentation. Give me one second. I have to find the right button. Here we go. Share and full screen. Okay. Great. And, and I'll just uh, actually, um, I could just let people know if you have questions, you can already start putting them in the Q&A. Um, so please go ahead and do that. We're going to be monitoring that and we'll hopefully get to that after the discussions. Thanks. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, and to comment on uh, this first report by the uh, Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance. Uh, I thought that Ryan and Camilo gave an excellent uh, summary of what the uh, report contains. And uh, what I would like to do is, um, before I go to some specific comments, to give um, a little bit of a uh, broader uh, uh, perspective on what they're trying to do. Um, and uh, you, you should bear in mind that um, my, my uh, I'm coming from um, climate finance, which is a somewhat narrower uh, in focus. Uh, and some of my uh, uh, comments will reflect that, as you will see. Uh, but let me let me say first that I thought this was a very informative uh, first report, and uh, I'm sure many more uh, insights will emerge as uh, uh, the team uh, expands their uh, their research and their coverage of uh, companies and uh, and investment uh, uh, investors. Um, so, in in terms of taking a big step back. Uh, um, I want to emphasize one key distinction that's already been uh, alluded to by uh, Raina and Camilo, but it's really a major distinction that frames the whole, uh, uh, the whole study. And that's a distinction between impact and ESG standards. Uh, I, you don't find uh, such a clear distinction being made elsewhere. And I thought this was very helpful here 
to make such a clear distinction. And so what is impact? It's, it's creating positive externalities. What is ESG? It's minimizing negative externalities. That's how the report puts it. Um, and you know, this then raises the question uh, uh, when we think about responsible investment, this whole investment area, is it more about impact or about ESG? I think that's an interesting question uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, requires more thought. I think the other link that's very interesting here is to the notions of materiality and double materiality. Uh, uh, one way you can think about impact versus ESG is you can think of ESG as being more about material risks relating to the environment, the social context for investors in a particular company, uh, whereas impact is more about double materiality i.e. Um, how a company's uh, operations create um, impacts on others that may, uh, you know, may be good or bad. So in that sense, impact can also be negative. Um, now, I think it's interesting here that Europe has taken, in my, in sort of my reading, Europe has taken, uh, has embraced the notions of double materiality and materiality, whereas I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that the US has. And so here, I think there's an issue for this study, which is uh, you know, how, how do you deal with potentially different uh, uh, trajectories being taken by regulators and investors in, in Europe versus the US and you know how is that going to play out uh, in this area? So, for example, you know uh, the the SEC uh, in the U.S. is considering a, a new um, a disclosure uh, regulation for for carbon emissions uh, that's uh, in the cards at the moment. Uh, hopefully, that will see the day in the near future. But uh, for those of you who have looked at the the new proposed. Uh, approach by the SEC and the new proposed rules, you will not find a single time that they refer to double materiality. The SEC is only concerned about materiality and uh, partly the reason is that the SEC has a narrow mandate to protect investors. And from that perspective, really, uh, you're really thinking about materiality rather than double materiality. Okay, so uh, my, my take, next comment, uh, my take on ESG, I will echo what Brian and Camillo have already said. Um, problem with ESG, this is a well-known theme, proliferation of themes and metrics. And one study that the, uh, one paper that the study cites is by Berg, Kolbel and Rigobon, titled Aggregate Confusion. Uh, and, uh, you know, they point out there are 64 ESG themes and 709 indicators. So clearly we need uh, some, some form of synthesis here, and some form of standardization. And this is what this uh, uh, report is trying to do. Now, you might ask, you know, where is this confusion coming from, this aggregate confusion? And, and I would point uh, partly to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they go in many different directions. And, you know, if you're trying to achieve all those goals, I mean, Raina mentioned that one, co one company claims to achieve all 17 goals and she wondered whether that was, could be true. Uh, you know, but when you're trying to pursue all these 17 goals, yeah, I mean, you're gonna have many different themes and clearly uh, many different indicators. Uh, and so you might wanna ask, uh, uh, in, for, you know, this just goes beyond this study, but you might uh, want to ask, are we trying to do too much at the same time? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, you know, what are the priorities? Um, and I think uh, here, th th this study could benefit by playing this, this issue up a bit more and being a little bit more, um, what's the right word, being a bit more uh, um, daring 
in suggesting what should be the priorities, because I think that's part of the 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 the, the issue here is that uh, uh, if you don't if you don't think in terms of priorities, you are going to be stuck with uh, a very uh, uh, large set of themes. Um, I think another issue uh, in terms of framing uh, of uh, uh, the measurement and reporting, uh, both with respect to ESG and impact, is um, you know what's the objective? Is the objective to guide investment to particular projects that have high impact or particular areas that are, are uh, uh, you know, respectful of the environment, for example, uh, is that the objective or is the objective to provide better risk measurement for investors who are worried about the broader risks they might be exposed to with respect to climate, uh, social and political risk. Um, now, the, 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 the study doesn't really frame uh, the issue that way and mostly uh, um, tries to give a sort of a state of the of the of things as they are today uh, and and, and uh, this is um, reflected in the notion of uh, maturity as they put it of the ESG reporting now the good news I took from the report from the study is uh, is the is that what comes out is that actually GRI standards are pro very widely used. This is something that Raina also mentioned, and something that I was really surprised by is that uh, uh, um, a lot of these sustainability reports are audited. I think this is really a big step forward. Um, I think both for uh, when it comes to uh, the reporting of in uh, of institutional investors and the reporting of companies on the sustainability front, I think the near future will be one where, maybe this year already, will be one where there will be much more scrutiny uh, in terms of whether there is uh, greenwashing or not. And so I, I really think this is a very important initiative because uh, it will help analysts uh, decide What's you know what's a plausible sustainability report? What's a less plausible one? Where is that greenwashing, and so on? And I think in in uh, uh, in this respect, um, I would encourage the authors to provide more granular information on impact and ESG. I thought, for example, uh, the discussion, the analysis of um, you know more detailed analysis of uh, environmental impact. Uh, was very helpful here, and that, that's something that I, I would uh, uh, play up. Uh, and you know, I had similar questions as uh, Raina mentioned at the end of her presentation, uh, um, with respect to the green taxonomy. Uh, you know, how does this all fit in uh, with the green taxonomy? That was a major question I had. It would be good to maybe say that explicitly. Uh, you know, uh, how, how does this uh, study uh, uh, fit in with uh, the EU, uh, EU green, green taxonomy, which is, I think, the most complete effort on the regulatory front uh, uh, on, uh, on sustainability. Great. Uh, with thank that, you. Yes, I think. Uh, thank you for telling me <laughs> I'm coming to the end. And that was, in fact, the end of my presentation. Perfect. Thank you, uh, yeah. thank you uh, Professor Bolton. You raised some very important issues, uh, the clarity between uh, ESG and impact, um, also this issue of enterprise value versus uh, um, what I like to call dynamic materiality instead of the single and double, and the issue that you know the ISSB, which is global, is really taking this enterprise value approach but with the hope of being able to take a broader, more dynamic materiality approach in the future. Uh, whereas of course the US and other countries really are, are wanting to stick to the uh, single financial materiality. So this is quite a big debate and, and having global standards, of course, is gonna be really important. Um, also, I think you know, there's a distinction between impact measurement and management versus disclosure. Not all disclosure is, uh, based only on regulation. There are 
organizations that choose to disclose uh, in a voluntary way. So they're disclosing more than the minimum common denominator that regulators are asking for. And I think that's what's important. And I think that's some of what we've seen in these two studies. Um, you know, also it's that the, the sample came from groups of firms that already were interested in ESG and impact. So I think we would expect to see that as well. Anyway, a lot of important issues. Uh, time is running very quickly. Um, so we're gonna turn now to Maria Teresa uh, Zapia. She's deputy director of Blue Orchard and of course very well known in the impact space in Switzerland and beyond. Uh, Maria Teresa. Great, thank you very much, uh, Karen. And uh, thanks to uh, the Center for Finance and Development and the Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance and of course the Geneva Graduate Institute for having me. Um, I, I actually have to say, I, 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 as, as a practitioner and probably not as an academic, uh, I'm probably the minority here, so I'll try to be I'll try to be nice to all of you, but jokes apart, as a practitioner, I found it, the, the study very interesting. And if I had to, you know, comment on, let's say, aspects that surprised me and aspects that actually were somehow in line with my expectation, I'd put in the first bucket, the bucket that, uh, uh, you know, surprised me is that on the impact side, there seemed to be you know, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, good, uh, let's say, um, practitioners in terms of defining impact KPIs and impact metrics. Um, I would certainly be interested in, in actually not only looking at the impact KPIs, but really going through the impact reporting of, you know, of some of these investors to really see if, you know, the impact intention are then um, really switched into, uh, you know, measured and, and measure, managed impact. And also really see if uh, these impact KPIs are effectively uh, satisfying the investors' requests in terms of, you know, expected uh, outcomes of these, you know, impact investing strategies, because that's where we often see if you want a gap. Uh, aspects that I found um, in line with my expectations were about uh, materiality, even from an ESG perspective being you know, challenging for uh, for many of the um, uh, you know companies, especially in the ESG pool. I think there is still, as as we just said, there is still quite a lot of confusion about uh, uh, what is uh, material to a company. Uh, I think the first you know mapping of materiality done by SASB already a few years ago has then evolved and and we have seen a lot of discussions on materiality even as as Patrick was saying uh where you know we we see different interpretations by region uh and so the depth and breadth of materiality changes uh, widely and these, uh, and so for me, the implementation of materiality, when we talk about in particular environmental, social and governance practices, but also in impact, doesn't seem to be surprising that there is so, if you want, uh, um, so limited, you know, comprehensive implementation of materiality um, in terms of impact and ESG. Uh, the other aspect that I didn't find surprising was the fact that, um, you know, there is still, uh, I mean, auditing is something that an external verification is starting, something that is uh, uh, growing, but still uh, in partly limited. What I would like to say as well is that the auditing is uh, that we see very often for, you know, large uh, asset owners or asset managers is uh, uh, very much, uh, you know, you have an auditing report and 99% is actually focused on the financials. And then there is a very light assurance on ESG and impact practices. Uh, so in a way there is an auditing that still has a very, very strong way towards 
you know, financial performance as opposed to, you know, the impact alpha that goes with it. Uh, so even when it's there, I would, I would, if you allow me, I would uh, potentially, uh, you know, uh, question the the depth of the audit on on really more on the impact measurement and, and management systems. Um, what I thought was interesting as well was how you the sample was uh, taken on uh, on the impact side. I think the operating principle for impact management, and if you want the community of almost 170 signatories, it's really a great pool to look at it. Also, because in that pool, you have both investors that have 100% of their strategies within impact investing and those that have, you know, only some strategies. So it's, it's also a diversified pool that is not only of the impact investing, uh, if you want asset class, but you also have, you know, large asset managers. I'm thinking, you know, for example, Schroders that has a part of its book like Blue Orchard in Impact. So, um, in terms of, uh, uh, I guess, the definition of impact uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we were referring to before, uh, one thing that we have done at, at Blue Orchard has really been thinking more than thinking about externalities and uh, uh, positive and negative externalities has been to really define uh, and make, if you want, uh, have a clear distinction between ESG as sustainable practices and impact as concentrating on companies, goods and services. So I think that could be something potentially to to be more nuanced in a, in a follow up uh, in a follow up report. And then, last but not least, my interest would be also to for potentially have a split of different buckets in the samples that we look at, where we can split the corporates from the financial institution and also potentially listed companies from, uh, you know, private companies, just to see what are the dynamics in these two, in these sub pools, because we have seen that, you know, impact investing started, for example, from private assets. And if we look historically, it has been very much, you know, the financial inclusion sector, financial institution, but has then moved into, you know, private companies, corporates, and now more recently in uh, enlisted companies. So I, I think it would be very interesting for me to, to have more granularity on, on the sample. And, and I'll close my, uh, my comments here because I, I think, uh, Karen, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you back the mic. Thank you, uh, Maria Teresa. Uh, a number of good points you raised, including this one about uh, public and private markets and the sample. That was also uh, a thought I had when I when I had read the paper because there are so many different uh, uh, sectors, subsectors, subsegments uh, in the markets and and with different strategies and approaches. Also, your point about KPI was well taken. You know, we often, as my the former chief of staff of, at OECD used to say. Uh, measure what you treasure, don't treasure what you measure. And often people get carried away with what they can measure and they forget what really matters. So thank you for, for reminding us of, of that. So I know time is very short. Uh, we're allowed to go a little bit over time for people that can stay. Uh, we do have questions in the chat and I also wanted to give uh, Raina and Camilo a chance to comment on what the discussants have said. So um, maybe we could start with that and I'll look at the Q&A and see if I can pick out a couple of them. Rhino, would you like to go first? With yes, some I would like to go first. I would like to thank uh, mostly Patrick who commented on the sustainability uh, disclosure part. I think uh, the comments are well taken. Uh, I think this distinction and that was raised by Marisa, Maria Theresia also between what impact aims to do and ESG aims to capture is not so clear to me. I think companies sometimes uh, uh, try to do both. So we have done a number of studies which show that ESG is a risk mitigation tool. But be besides that, many companies seem to also 
mix it a little bit with impact. So I, I don't know where the frontier is, and that's certainly an area where I think uh, academics could benefit from practitioners, because I think our view is a bit different from uh, the view from uh, the practitioners on stage. So uh, on the responsible, what are responsible investors? So we just wrote a report that's going to be launched next week at CPR uh, on institutional investors as responsible investors. I view in my in my definition with Philip in this report, we view uh, most institutional investors as responsible investors and a subset of them as impact investors who go uh, one step further. But again, there's no really accepted, you know, uh, terminology. And then what I found very interesting in what you said, and I think that deserves a broader reflection is this concept of materiality and double materiality and how differently it is embraced uh, in the US versus the uh, EU. So certainly, I think uh, the, the one of the limitation of this study, it's a snapshot, it's a, you know, it's a capture of screen of the situation at a given point in time be before many of these regulation actually become enforceable, at least in terms of sustainability reporting. Uh, in Europe. So what would be interesting is if we could continue, you know, looking at the trends over time and the gap between the US and and um, and Europe. But I, I'll stop here. There's much more I wanted to say, but I'll let Camilo talk maybe more on the impact side. If Great. Uh, thank you, Raina. And certainly this market is uh, very dynamic <laughs> and <laughs> moving it, moving yes. quickly. So there's a lot of future work to be done here. And I think this confusion between ESG and impact in some ways comes out of what Maria Teresa said. In the public markets, um, people started using the term ESG investing. And I think that's where a lot of confusion came in because ESG is really a risk mitigation tool. But you know, in public markets, they're using it as a screening criteria. So right. anyway, um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work also still to be done there. And, you know, I like the fact that you said most investors are responsible investors. I think all investors should be responsible investors. I don't think it's just for people who call themselves impact investors or ESG investors or whatever label they want to put on. But Camilo, um, I turn over to you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, thank you, Maria Teresa and Professor Bolton for, for the comments, all, all great comments. I won't be able to touch on, on everything I want, but uh, let me pick. So. On, uh, on Professor Bolton's comments, which were mostly about ESG, I have to say that definitely impact is not only about positives, it should be about negatives, but, but it is a struggle because, of course, uh, investors and companies like to talk about the positives more than the negatives. And I think that's a natural bias, but hopefully we can get better at measuring the negative effects. But I think you, you then uh, um, put it there that it's, it's on negatives. Um, Maria Teresa, on, on the practices on, on impact KPIs, I, I couldn't agree more. And this is exactly why we are doing this study and where we are going, is really going deeper into specific themes and sectors and try to see what is the practice, what do you have here from the, let's say the theory, the academic world, and try to see if we can come up with convincing criteria uh, so that we focus on on really what uh, what is important. I think alluding to uh, uh, what Karen said of of uh, measuring what what you should care for, and that's what we are aiming to identify by looking at these two worlds. It, it seems to us that this has been a uh, the practice of of uh, measuring and uh, reporting and disclosing is more uh, basically coming from the practitioners in their best effort. Uh, but bringing, let's say, academia and uh, literature to this uh, will help a lot, at least on the on the on the impact side, uh, from what uh, we have basically shared with with you and others uh, in the in the impact uh, uh, community. And uh, fully agree with the auditing. We here are just scratching the surface on each one of these areas, uh, but we didn't aim to judge the quality of the of that auditing and how deep it goes. So. We hope that in the in the next uh, phase of this, uh, we can go deeper in a very small number of, uh, of of themes and sectors, so that we can respond to some of those questions that you had 
uh, with, uh, with more detail. Let me stop there and thank you again. Great, thank you. And again, uh, uh, time is uh, short, um, but there are a couple of questions around uh, ESG and reporting and uh, auditing and also the E, the S and the G. And I know uh, Raina covered this in her presentation. Um, but the general question, I think, uh, sort of grouping a few questions together, um, you know, how are how far away are we from uh, making further progress uh, on E? We've made a lot of progress on climate. How do we make progress on biodiversity and many of the other E issues, um, but particularly on the S and also the G, uh, as we saw in the presentation, is also lacking. What is it going to take? What's the role of government? Uh, what's the role of the private sector? Raina? So that's Camilla? a very delicate question. I think one of the reasons why when Nathan came to see me was that the Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance, because its position in Geneva with the human rights and everything, was to conduct research on the S and the G pillars. Um, I think two things is that everything, by definition, the social and the governance pillars are more subjective. You know, what does it mean to contribute to the health or the well-being of your employees? What is well-being? I mean, these are notions that rather, you know, CO2 emissions you can sort of quantify. And even there, there's a lot of problems. But I'm saying so it's much softer information. But what I was puzzled when I did the study on ESG rating disagreement is how low the, 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 the consensus was on the governance pillar. And I think uh, one of the issues I'm very interested in is, uh, you know, we had this uh, notion of corporate governance serving the shareholders, which basically, you know, when you teach a one on one course, you say everything has to be done to maximize shareholder value and there's corporate governance in there. And I think as we move into sustainable finance, there has to be a redefinition of what corporate governance should be. And it's a much more stakeholder oriented corporate governance. And I think academics haven't done much research on that from a conceptual or a theoretical perspective so that I'm not surprised that you find the same old metrics that we had in the 90s, you know, board independence, how many females on the boards or, but to me, we're really very far beyond even uh, conceptually. And uh, so, so I think it's going to take a lot of time, and that's, I think it, it it needs a push on the regulatory side. I think it needs a push from the private sector, but specifically for corporate governance, it needs a redefinition of what we mean by corporate governance. So that's I will stop there. Great, thank you. And I I always say from my days at OECD that uh, particularly in new market areas. Both the role of the public and private sector is really important and it's a bit of a dance. Sometimes the private sector needs to be in the lead, sometimes the public sector, but you need them working together. And, and as you pointed out, the very important role that academia plays in bringing evidence to the table and uh, fully agree with your point about the G <laughs> and rethinking corporate governance. Camillo, did you want to come in on this as well? Well, I'll pick on something that I wanted to say before, which is on this materiality, double materiality. It is more of an ESG issue related to uh, what companies report on. But I think if we are able to make some progress on how impact investors and investors, let's say more in general, can look at this and can agree on, uh, then that, that could contribute to that. And here, with respect to this last question, I think the, 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 these guidance could be uh, good for the for the social, at least for the social. And you know, I, I won't get into the governance, but I think on the social side, there's a lot of impacts that investors uh, try to contribute to and have the intent to do. Uh, I think Raina quickly mentioned issues on gender, and uh, many of uh, of us as investors uh, try to push companies along those lines uh, and are trying to measure those kinds of impacts. So. If we are able to make some progress on this, I think we could contribute not only to the S, but the double materiality issue. How to Ter tackle it. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I want to give uh, Maria Teresa and also uh, Professor Bolton a chance to 
comment if we still have a few moments maria Teresa, see your yeah, hand so, up. so on my side i mean i wouldn't wanted to reflect further on uh, what uh, raina just said i think it's interesting if we look at the uh, uh, UN global compact violations, the majority are actually on S and G. So again, I think what is interesting is that we have a lack of consensus, a lack of, you know, best practices, but in fact, we, there is a consistent, you know, best practice that comes in, ES, in S and G. And the other thing that I, and so one more reason, of course, to, to do something about it as investors and as practitioners, at the same time, we I think one aspect of SNG is the fact that um, it is uh, very localized. You know, a company in China would have uh, very different, uh, you know, just because of the rule of law and the setup, um, you know, practices compared to a company in Europe. So again, it's very difficult to generalize uh, what good looks like. And again, I don't want to say that this is an excuse not to uh, not to do it. And in fact, and the third aspect is that engagement in uh, in um, in social and governance practices has been really proving very successful uh, from you know both in listed companies and in private equity companies. So I think that exactly because it's a stakeholder uh, impact, it does require almost an investor and investee, you know, a framework where, you know, there are effectively, it, it almost becomes like a joint, uh, you know, objective. So I'm, I'm convinced that the focus that has been on E uh, also because of the climate of all, you know, the, the green bonds, all the development of climate finance generally, um, you know, will have to be extended to SNG. Also, because at the end of the day, without SNG, there is not a good E. So, you know, it's not that without governance, we can actually follow, uh, I don't know, have a, a proper sustainability link bond. So I, I really, I'm, I'm a big believer that SNG will follow and engagement is key in, in, in moving this forward uh, as, part, as part of the ESG and impact agenda. Thank you. Uh, very good points. And I think those might be good points to close on. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to our hosts <laughs> to see if we can still go a little bit longer or we, we wrap up here. Um, it's been a very good discussion. Thank you so much to the two researchers and their presentations and the discussants and the good questions in the chat. Obviously, a lot more work to be done uh, and uh, great that the sustainable, the Swiss Lab for Sustainable Finance is tackling these really important issues. So let me turn it back, uh, Nathan, uh, to you and to your colleague, Melita. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, uh, Patrick, Camilo, Rania, and Maria Teresa. Uh, that's the order on my screen. So, and thank you the audience for, for attending this, uh, this webinar and we hope to see you in the future installments of this project. So have a good evening and bye-bye. Uh,